What's up, everyone? Welcome to week nine. I realized last time that there's people who are starting to watch these videos now. Um, just go back and watch the previous videos, and then you guys can get caught up to where I am, how I got here, what trials and tribulations I had to face in order to start doing what I'm doing now. That being said, I ask you guys to hit that thumbs up button now that we can use our thumbs and it's out of the cast. Subscribe if you haven't, and please let me know what's going on with your rehab schedule. I love the comments. I love being able to compare how and what I'm doing compared to what you guys are doing, and it just makes us feel like we're all in this together. Updates. Week 9. Um, give you a little bit of free ticket to the gun show there. That's the injured guy. I can hold more of a flex now with him as opposed to before. Before, remember the whole the diesel? More like a Tesla now, just to slow and steady, you know? Compare that to the, the non-injured side, and you can kind of see the, the aesthetic differences there. Um, I had one person ask whether or not it's going to look different, and it will. Just the intrinsic nature of how the tendon is now shorter and it's closer to the insertion site. So you won't have that. So so here you can kind of see a little bit of a drop off when it's going into the crook of your elbow. Kind of see where that's supposed to happen. Here it won't do that. Or the, the operated side, it'll do that less. You can just think of that because now the tendon is shorter and so the belly of the muscle is pulled in to the crook of the elbow and you don't have that drastic drop off before you get the insertion of the tendon. It's more of just like a gradual whale hump now instead of a Mount Kilimanjaro peak. And so that's fine. Discussed in the previous videos, the aesthetics to me aren't that much of a concern. I'm more worried about functionality, strength, fatigability, all the things that will affect my day to day. Also, last week I discussed how this thing was getting a little uncomfortable. Oh, oh, oh it's a deep burn. Oh, it's so deep. Ah. I forgot to mention that it was also around the same time that I was cycling off my turmeric supplement. So if you guys watch, I think it was my second video, I discussed what supplements, vitamins, multivitamins, adaptogens that I was taking in order to expedite the healing process. Turmeric, curcumin, was one of those supplements. And so I cycle off the curcumin every 30 days or whenever my bottle runs out, I'll, I'll kind of wait a couple of weeks before I buy a new one. Or if I have one stocked, I'll wait a couple of weeks before I open it and start reincorporating it into my daily stack. And that's just important for certain supplements. So that, plus the fact that I started banging this thing with physio, RMT, pull workouts, clinical hours, and the lack of anti-inflammatory uh, properties of the turmeric, I think made for all of last week to be a little bit, a little troublesome. But I'm good now, now that, now that I'm taking it again. Plus the fact that I'm probably getting stronger as the days go by. I'm allowing that bicep and the tendon to rehab. Um, I'm resting it before I go and start loading it again. I think it's the progression. You can kind of see it. And the recovery for this is so fast. I know it doesn't seem like that at the beginning. But once the ball starts rolling and you're, allowed, you're, you're able to rehab it, you're able to, to load it, you're going to start seeing, like I explained in my last video, that your progression is going to ramp up very quickly. And so I'm doing the same, if not more weights and exercises. I'm taking it further past the range of motion as before. You don't notice it as much. And so for me, that's just a sign of it getting better. So in this video, I recorded what my physio and me were doing during his sessions. I had two sessions that I recorded and we can go over. I can upload both of them. They're pretty much the same things just testing my range of motion to see how far my supination and my pronation was going. So I want to go over that. I also want to go over the difference between conventional physio rehab schedule, which is more so focusing on isolation exercises of the bicep, starting to load that up and then progress towards heavier and heavier weights. Whereas the rehab schedule I'm doing, the non-conventional, I guess you can, you can call it, 
is you start with you start with a compound movement and then target the bicep indirectly from that. I want to explain why I chose to go that direction as opposed to the conventional and the drawbacks to it that I think you will encounter unless you, you are aware of it. Let's start with the rehab. I mentioned in one of my comments that I felt that my pronation and supination came back 100% around week six. That was a lie. At least I thought it did. I didn't realize what I was doing during the movement to compensate for the lack of mobility in that certain range. And so it took my physio to point this out. And it also took him putting me in front of a mirror and showing me what the body was doing in order to compensate for the movement. So if you, first of all, you, when you attach your supination and pronation, you should, should have your elbows by your side. And I'm just going to adjust the camera here so that you guys can see me. So you should have your elbows by your side here, as opposed to just flat down and that's so that you can prevent any upper arm movements taking over and allowing you to, to supinate and pronate your wrist further than you actually can what you should do and these are mental cues that i was taught is you should pin your elbow down to your side flip or pronate the arm let's just do one arm here the injured arm you pronate the arm to its end range of motion and then you supinate it to its end range of motion. And if you're sitting in front of a mirror, for me, I'm just using the, the viewfinder of this camera, you should notice that everything in your upper shoulder girdle, you, you should be looking straight, you shouldn't be bending over and compensating, should be aligned. And so for me, what I was doing when I got in there in my six week mark, thinking that everything was comparable to my non-injured side what was happening was when i was pronating and supinating with my good side everything was fine but then when i was pronating and supinating with my my surgical site i would stop at a certain position like let's say pronation i would stop shy of what this could do and then i would lift up my shoulder and my trap to compensate for extra movement with the wrist and like my elbow would flare up and like obviously i'm exaggerating for you guys so you can see the point but it was it was to a point where like my shoulder would ride up and i would like flare my elbow out just so that i could get the same pronation as my good side and so if you think about that your mind knows it's going from point a to point b so from supination to pronation and you're telling it that you want it to go the same range as your good side unless you have these mental cues elbow in shoulder and trap down head straight up shoulder girdle straight parallel to the floor then what's going to happen is once you hit that sticky point in range of motion which happens mostly for pronation by the way i also had someone ask that whether or not their pronation and supination came back at the same rates pronation comes back a little bit later and so let's talk about where that gets sticky all of a sudden, you lift up your shoulder, you, you flare out your elbow to get that extra bit of range that you're trying to get, that you normally get with your, your non-injured side. And so your mind knows that it's going from point A to point B, and it's going to do everything it can to get there. And if you get stuck, it'll compensate. And so for me, when I, when I answer the question, how's your pronation and supination? I'm like, oh, it's fine. Like, what I would do is I would hold a dowel what I would do is I would hold a dowel, let's say, and I would pronate and I would supinate. And then I would compare it to my good side. I would pronate and I would supinate. And then I would kind of look at the angulation that I leave my good side at. Okay, so that's pronation there. So it should be coming at like a 45 degree, if not less, maybe 40 if I push it. So my in injured site, I should get close to 40 or 45 degrees. And initially around week six, I wasn't able to, if I'm, if I'm using those mental cues, elbows tucked in, shoulder down, shoulder girdle parallel to the floor. But I would, if I kind of tilted and like lifted up my shoulder, I'm like, oh, look at that. It's perfect. It's, it's, it's more so I can, my, my range of motion is, is even better than my left, but I wasn't aware of all what was going on to compensate for that sticky motion. And so 
it was a rude awakening when I got into the physio. He explained to me what I was doing in order to get that end range of movement. And he helped me with those cues and allowed me to stretch it out in that fashion. And so basically what he said, and using this as an example, is you, you supinate as much as you can. And then you give some resistance towards pronation, meaning you're still supinating, but now there's a load on the end of it. You do that for about five, 10 seconds, and then you let go and then you supinate more. And that's called PNF. And that basically overrides your body's safety system to not push past a certain range of motion. So by loading the antagonistic muscle or the antagonistic movement, it allows for more of the range of motion you're trying to accomplish. And you can do that for the opposite. So if we're trying to do extra range of pronation, and here you want to make sure that all your fingers are in line. The problem with me was my pinky was riding up, and so all your fingers are in line with the, with the dowel. And then you lift up and you resist with pronation. Five seconds or so. And then you let go and then you pronate more. Again, keeping your elbow tucked in, shoulder girdle down, head looking straight. And you just do reps of that. Just do reps of that. And then that will allow your pronation and supination and your tendon to stretch throughout its, its range which is what we want. We also use some rehab bands called TheraBands, and they come in different colors. Different colors represent different resistance. We were using the red one, and basically just doing some banded curls. We would uh, angulate the band so it would come down to the opposite side of the feet, and you can kind of see it in the video here. And then we would do pronation, resisting with supination, and vice versa, supination, resisting, pronation, pronation, resisting, supination. And that felt good. That felt very, very controlled. It also felt like it was strengthening a very weak movement in my body. And so that was basically it. We did that for two weeks. We haven't really progressed into anything because it's still a lacking in those movements. And I think that by taking it slow for that will help and it will complement the the expedited compound lifts in the gym and so that's a good transition into speaking on the topic of what i feel the difference is between the conventional physio rehab process and the expedited compound loading rehab process which is what i'm doing now so the conventional physio rehab process you basically isolate the bicep with either cable curls or uh, dumbbell curls slowly up until you get strength in the bicep and then once you have comparable strengths either side which can take up to six eight ten weeks sometimes depending on how fast and how stringent you are on your exercises once that is comparable then you can start doing compound lifts uh, bilateral movements and um, start incorporating your normal workout routines but up until then it's literally isometric loading isolation of the bicep now, I think that's great. I think that it's tried and tested. It's true. And everyone who's anyone who's going through this is usually following that type of rehab schedule. But once I injured myself, I started collecting data through either papers, studies, anecdotal evidence through other people's rehab schedule and, and recovery process. And I also started following the power lifters who had gotten injured and their, and their recovery process. And I started to see that these people were jumping back into the gym way faster than the conventional physio rehab schedule. Obviously, they're, they're super athletes. They train. It's what they do for a living. And so I'm not comparing myself to them. But what it made me realize is that it can be done. It's, you don't necessarily have to start slow and ramp your way up. You can kind of do them simultaneously. You can do compound lifts while strengthening your bicep and isolating it. And so again, I reached out to the people who everyone was referring me to, Dr. John Patrizzo, and he laid out 
the, I want to call the Dr. John Pachuzo method or the compound loading expedited rehab process, I guess is another way of calling it. But it made sense to me. Now, I've been doing it for the past little bit, a little bit shy of a month now, coming out to the end of my ninth week. And so far, so good. It's allowing me to stay active and be, be active quicker than if I were to do the conventional rehab schedule. But there are things that I've noticed during that need to be pointed out. As I explained earlier, during the pronation and supination, unless you're aware of what you're doing, you won't realize that your body's compensating movements by shifting and tilting other parts of your, your body, shoulder joints, neck joint, your hip joint, even till it kind of push you over the edge again exaggerating the movement but you get the idea and so the same thing can happen during a compound movement if you're benching and again biceps are stimulated in that movement very lightly but they are if you aren't aware of all of your cues on like how to properly bench and how to keep your shoulders back pinned keep your chest flared up and push through the bar grip it right like all these cues that you need in order to to lock your body into the proper mechanics, you could get into trouble when you are doing compound lifts with a weak bicep. Because what's going to happen is by not doing that and just going under the bar and pushing, you might compensate for a weak muscle by active by overactivating other muscles. And so that's kind of the trade-off for jumping into compounds right away. I think if you are inexperienced or if you're someone that doesn't really have a good background in, in weightlifting and training and you're, you're jumping into this as well as trying to learn the movements and, and the cues for these compound exercises, it might not be for you. Now, I'm not saying I have the best form, but I do feel that I have the fundamentals down in order to apply this rehab process so again for for pulling motions you need to be aware that your, your traps are down your shoulder blades are pinned back you're coming in with the movement you're squeezing at the top again it sounds easy to do but once you're in that position and you're doing it for reps on reps on reps on reps you might lose focus and once you lose focus other muscles are going to fire to compensate for a weak muscle and that could lead to muscular imbalances down the road there's a trade-off for everything. You can jump back into the gym quick, but you have to be aware of all of your movements and you have to be aware of your form. Or you can take the slow and steady approach, training your bicep to strengthen to a point where once you get under the bar for a bench press, even if you don't have those cues in, the chance of you overriding a weak bicep will no longer be there because the bicep won't be weak. And so you, you pick and choose your battles. And that's pretty much it. I had another comment um, about why I continue to do these movements or these barbell workouts with the weights that I'm using if the chance of injury are there. And I feel like that's kind of a loaded question. You don't know, you don't go into these workouts thinking that there's a chance of injury. I mean, at least I don't. Otherwise, you're just you're just going to be stressed. Like if, if every time you go to pull the bar on a deadlift, you think of your biceps tearing, <laughs> it's going to be a rough pull day. And so I think that even though there is a risk associated with barbell movements, I think if you take the right precautions, you're, you're warmed up, you're hydrated, you, you stretch, then you can minimize those risks and still gain all the benefits that there are with respect to that movement. And that reminded me when I first started coming back into the gym, and my arm was in a sling. I was doing leg workouts, or I was working on my opposite side, as you guys know. I had diff two different groups of people come up to me. One, where people would kind of commend me on my my effort and my my mindset. Basically, they were like, "Good job for coming back in. It takes a lot. Proud of you. Keep going. You'll recover fast." And like very positive. And then I had another subset of people that came up to me and they're like, what are you doing back at the gym? Go home, rest, like you'll get it back later. No need to do this. How did you injure yourself? That's why I don't do deadlifts. You're pulling too much. And I mean, I, both of them were very friendly people. I'm not saying one subset versus the other were kind of mean about it. But what I did notice between the two 
was the group of people that were supportive, surprised, and like the go-getter mentality, they were all in great shape. All of them. Aesthetically, they take care of themselves. They looked good. Whereas the people who told me to go home and kind of like take it easy, they were more the people who kind of like you, you, you would just, you would imagine they were, they were new with the gym. But you know, the kind of people that you see go to the gym for a while, but don't really change. And so I started thinking about that. I started digging a little deeper. I'm like, is that the reason why these people don't really have the, the changes that they're, they're looking for in the gym? Is it because they're not pushing themselves to a certain degree? Are they worried about injury during reps? Or am I just digging into this too much? I, was, I became a philosopher at the gym when I started going again, when I had my arm in a sling. You start to... Uh, you start to have more time to think when you're not gasping for air between sets. You also become a little bit of a creep because you start watching people do, for instance, Olympic lifts, clean and jerks, snatches, barbell curls, preacher curls, and you're kind of just watching from afar, jealous, being like, man, I wish I could do that right now, while you're sitting on like the seated hip abduction machine, just just working your glute mead because it's the only thing you can do at the time. All right, so we're at this machine. It's called the hip abduction. You literally push your knees out like this. I've never used this machine in the past, but like because of this splint, I'm limited to what exercise I can do. And so we're, we're venturing, guys. We're venturing to new exercises. But um, that's pretty much it. That's the rehab. That's the physio. That's what I'm going through now. Not much has changed. I will update you guys on my next video when I think I'm going to start low bar squatting. I'm going to start deadlifting, which is, again, still a little bit tricky mentally. But I'm sure I can do it. And I'll give you guys an update during week 10. So like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't, and uh, see you guys on the next one.